Hello, my darling, and welcome to today's story time. If you like what you hear, please make sure to subscribe. And now, on with our story time. After eons of climbing, there came a cough from the darkness above, and matters assumed a very grave and unexpected turn. It was clear that a ghast, or perhaps even more, had strayed into that tower before the coming of Carter and his guides, and it was equally clear that his peril was very close. After a breathless second, the leading ghoul pushed Carter to the wall and arranged his two kinsfolk in the best possible way. He then raised the old slate tombstone for a crushing blow when the enemy might come into sight. Ghouls can see in the dark, so the party was not as badly off as Carter would have been alone. In another moment, the clatter of hooves revealed the downward hopping of at least one beast, and the slab-bearing ghouls poised their weapon for a desperate blow. Presently, two yellowish-red eyes flashed into view, and the panting of the ghast became audible above its clattering. As it hopped down the step to just above the ghouls, they wielded the ancient gravestone with prodigious force. Then there was only a wheeze and a choking before the victim collapsed in a noxious heap. There seemed to be only this one animal, and after a moment of listening, the ghouls tapped Carter as a signal to proceed again. As before, they were obliged to aid him, and he was glad to leave that place of carnage, where the gas, uncouth remains, sprawled invisible in the blackness. At last the ghouls brought their companion to a halt, and feeling above him, Carter realized that the great stone trapdoor was reached at last. To open so vast a thing completely was not to be thought of, but the ghouls hoped to get it up just enough to slip the gravestone under as a prop, and this would then permit Carter to escape through the crack. They themselves planned to descend again and to return through the city of the Gugs, since their elusiveness was great, and they did not know the way overland to spectral sarcomand with its lion-guarded gate to the abyss. Mighty was the straining of those three ghouls at the stone of the door above them, and Carter helped push with as much strength as he had. They judged the edge near the top of the staircase to be the right one, and they pushed and pushed. After a few moments, a crack of light appeared, and Carter, to whom that task had been entrusted, slipped the end of the old gravestone in the aperture. There now ensued a mighty heaving, but progress was very slow, and they had, of course, to return to their first position every time they failed to turn the slab and prop the portal open again. Suddenly their desperation was magnified a thousandfold by a sound on the steps below them. It was only the thumping and rattling of the slain ghast's hoofed body as it rolled down to lower levels. But of all the possible causes of that body's dislodgement and rolling, none was in the least reassuring. Therefore, knowing the ways of Gugs, the ghouls set to with something of a frenzy and in a surprisingly short time had the door so high that they were able to hold it still whilst Carter turned the slab and left a generous opening. They now helped Carter through, letting him climb up their rubbery shoulders and later guiding his feet as he clutched at the blessed soil of the upper dreamland outside. Another second, and they were through themselves, knocking away the gravestone and closing the great trap door while a panting became audible beneath. Because of the Great One's curse, no gug might ever emerge from that portal. So with a deep relief and sense of repose, Carter lay quietly 
on the thick, grotesque fungi of the enchanted wood, while his guides squatted near in the manner that ghouls rest. Weird as was that enchanted wood, through which he had fared so long ago, it was verily a haven and a delight after the gulfs he now left behind, with no living denizen about it. For Zugs shunned the mysterious door in fear, and Carter at once consulted with his ghouls about their future course. To return through the tower, they no longer dared, and the waking world did not appeal to them, particularly when they learned that they must pass the priests, Nasht and Kaman Tha, in the Cavern of Flame. So at length, they decided to return through Sarcomont and its Gate of the Abyss, though of how to get there, they knew nothing. Carter recalled that it lies in the valley below Lang, and recalled likewise that he had seen in Dilathleen a sinister, old merchant, reputed to trade on Lang. Therefore he advised the ghouls to seek out Dilathleen, crossing the fields to near, and the sky, and following the river to its mouth. This they at once resolved to do, and lost no time in loping off, since the thickening of the dusk promised a full night ahead for travel, and Carter shook the paws of those repulsive beasts, thanking them for their help, and sending his gratitude to the beast, which once was Pikmin, but could not help sighing with pleasure when they left. For a ghoul is a ghoul, and at best an unpleasant companion for man. After that, Carter sought a forest pool, and cleansed himself of the mud of nether earth, thereupon resuming the clothes he had so carefully carried. It was now night in that redoubtable wood of monstrous trees, but because of phosphorescence, one might travel as well as by day. Therefore, Carter set out upon the well-known route to Selephiace, in Uthnargai, beyond the Tenarian hills. And as he went, he thought of the zebra he had left tethered to an ash tree on Negrenek, in a faraway Oriob, so many eons ago. And he wondered if any lava gatherer had fed and released it. And he wondered, too, if he would ever return to Baharna, and pay for the zebra that was slain by night in those ancient ruins by Yath shore. And he wondered, too, if the old tavern keeper would remember him. Such were the thoughts that came to him in the air of the regained upper dreamland. But presently his progress was halted by a sound from a very hollow tree. He had avoided the great circle of stones, since he did not care to speak with Zeus just now but it appeared from the singular fluttering in that huge tree that important councils were in session elsewhere. Upon drawing nearer, he made out the accents of a tense and heated discussion, and before long, he became conscious of matters which he viewed with the greatest concern. For a war on the cats was under debate in that sovereign assembly of Zugs. It all came from the loss of the party which had sneaked under Carter to Ulthar, and which the cats had justly punished for unsuitable intentions. The matter had long rankled, and now, least a month, the marshaled Zugs were about to strike the entire feline tribe in a series of surprise attacks. They would take individual cats or groups of cats unaware, and give not even the myriad cats of Ulthar a proper chance to drill and mobilize. This was the plan of the Zugs, and Carter saw that he must foil it before leaving on his mighty quest. Very quietly, therefore, did Randolph Carter steal to the edge of the wood and send the cry of the cat over the starlit fields, and a great grimalkin in a nearby cottage took up the burden, and he related across leagues of rolling meadows to warriors large and small black, gray, tiger, white, yellow, mixed. And it echoed through near and beyond the sky 
even into Ulthar. And Ulthar's numerous cats called in chorus and fell into a line of march. It was fortunate that the moon was not up, so that all the cats were on earth. Swiftly and silently leaping, they sprang from every hearth and housetop and poured in a great fury sea across the plains to the edge of the woods. Carter was there to greet them, and the sight of shapely, wholesome cats was indeed good for his eyes after the things he had seen and walked with in the abyss. He was glad to see his venerable friend and one-time rescuer at the head of Ulthar's detachment, a collar of rank round his sleek neck and whiskers bristling at a martial angle. Better still, as a sub-lieutenant in that army was a brisk young fellow who proved to be none other than the very kitten at the inn to whom Carter had given a saucer of rich cream way back on that long-vanished morning in Ulthar. He was a strapping and promising cat now, and he purred as he shook hands with his friend. His grandfather said he was doing very well in the army, and that he might well expect a captaincy after just one more campaign. Carter now outlined the peril of the cat tribe, and he was rewarded with deep-throated purrs of gratitude from all sides. Consulting with the generals, he prepared a plan of instant action, which involved marching at once upon the Zoo Council and other known strongholds of Zoogs, forestalling their surprise attacks and forcing them to terms before the mobilization of their army of invasion. Thereupon, without a moment's loss, that a great ocean of cats flooded the enchanted wood and surged around the council tree and the great stone circle. Flutterings rose to panic pitch as the enemy saw the newcomers. There was very little resistance among the furtive and curious brown zoogs. They saw that they were beaten in advance and turned from thoughts of vengeance to thoughts of present self-preservation. Half the cats now seated themselves in a circular formation with the captured zoogs in the center, and they left open a lane down which were marched the additional captives rounded up by the other cats in other parts of the wood. Terms were discussed at length, Carter acting as interpreter, and it was decided that the zoogs might remain a free tribe on condition of rendering to the cats a very large annual tribute of grouse, quail, and pheasants from the less fabulous parts of their forest. Twelve young zoogs of noble families were taken as hostages to be kept in the temple of the cats at Ulthar, and the victors made it plain that any disappearances of cats on the borders of the zoog domain would be followed by consequences highly disastrous to zoogs. These matters disposed of, the assembled cats broke ranks and permitted the zoogs to slink off one by one, which they hastened to do with many a sullen, backward glance. The old cat general now offered Carter an escort through the forest to whatever border he wished to reach, deeming it likely that the zoogs would harbor dire resentment against him for the frustration of their warlike enterprise. This offer he welcomed with gratitude, not only for the safety it afforded, but because he liked the graceful companionship of cats. So in the midst of a pleasant and playful regiment, relaxed after the successful performance of its duty, Randolph Carter walked with dignity through that enchanted and phosphorescent wood of titan trees, talking of his quest with the old general and his grandson, whilst others of the band indulged in fantastic gambles or chased fallen leaves that the wind drove among the fungi of the primeval floor. And the old cat said that he had heard much of unknown Gadoth in the cold waste, but he did not know where it was. As for the marvelous Sunset City, he had not even heard of that but would gladly relay to Carter 
anything he might later learn. And this, my darling, ends our story time for today. As always, I hope that you have very sweet and creepy dreams. Good night.